Hi, dear listeners. Welcome to this new episode of my podcast, A Digital Tomorrow. I'm joined today again by King Leung, head of fintech at Invest Hong Kong. Uh, King, uh, thank you very much for accepting my invitation, and it's my pleasure to host you again in my podcast. Well, it's a great pleasure. It's always nice to, uh, to chat with you, uh, Oriol. No, the pleasure is absolutely mine. It's always nice chatting with you as well, King. And I remember the last episode we did exactly one year ago in January was a very interesting one that many people viewed and, and many people reached out uh, to me talking about Hong Kong, especially people who are not that familiar with uh, Hong Kong. So maybe I wanted to ask to ask you, like uh, starting from the very beginning, um, since last um, January when we talked in my podcast, what has changed in Hong Kong from a business uh, perspective? <clears throat> well, um, first of all, uh, my role has expanded from uh, covering just fintech to covering the, all financial services, effective uh, in the middle part of uh, last year, 2023. So now my remit uh, covers not only fintech, but financial services, which covers everything from banking to insurance, asset management, uh, you, you name it. Now, at the same time, I'm also covering the, the carbon neutrality theme related to uh, financial services and uh, fintech. So by extension, uh, that would involve things like green finance, as well as uh, green fintech. So that has something to do with uh, the tracking of uh, scope-free data uh, to make sure that we got enough of the te uh, technological support to uh, minimize uh, greenwashing. So there's just a whole bunch of uh, new developments uh, that I've been covering since middle part of last year. Now, but going back to your question, because of, of my kind of expanded role, essentially the, the one thing I've been looking at is to see how can we find the synergies between the, the so-called mainstream finance as well as the, the future finance represented by FinTech and by extension, digital assets and Web3. And I have to say the one exciting thing is that when we look at just the whole world in terms of the tier one finance firms, they've also uh, shown their support and interest. So of course, I think for many of us who have been following this field, we would have noticed a large firms from the BlackRock, the Fidelity, like Franklin Templeton, JP Morgan, Apollo, so all these, you know, all these big names, they've been uh, trying different uh, means of using the blockchain infrastructure to facilitate uh, finance. So one common area that I've seen in several occasions, again, this is all public information. So you look at, for example, there's this major announcement by JP Morgan in Q4 uh, 2023, in which there's this JP Morgan chain is a permission chain, mm -hmm. but on top of this infrastructure, they facilitated the transactions between BlackRock and then Barclays Bank. And essentially what they, what they did was to essentially facilitate the money market fund transaction on the blockchain. Now, I think for people who have been like buying funds and all that uh, as a personal investment uh, choice, I wonder, wow, why, why would people bother? You know, to try to connect the dots of doing this thing that arguably is very common in traditional finance, but why would that be done on a blockchain infrastructure? Now, and the answer is, again, this is covered in various uh, news articles, mm -hmm. because essentially from our own personal experience, when a transaction uh, or fund transaction is done in a traditional way, there's always the consideration of like T plus three, so the number of days of delay before the transaction ultimately takes place. But then in the form of a blockchain-based kind of transaction, uh, I think a lot of the innovation is around this concept of atomic settlement. So this almost almost instantaneous to make this happen. So in doing so for some of the funds like the Money Market Fund, which the, the I would say the uh, margin may, may not be as high, so that's why every single bit of efficiency you can, you can squeeze out, this is all good, right? For the large, you know, multinational asset managers. So this is the motivation behind even the, the biggest of the Wall Street firms to, to basically put the way behind this. Now, in Hong Kong being in the national financial center, of course, we've been following the trends in the market as well. 
So that's why we've also been seeing uh, firms in Hong Kong doing exactly that. So trying different type of use cases in so-called traditional finance, but then having them done in a sort of blockchain, digital asset context. And there's just so many examples that in the interest of time that I, I may not be able to get in the details, but then uh, definitely if, if there's something of interest, I'm happy to elaborate a bit more. So this is one thing that is very interesting. It's the intersection of traditional finance and the future of finance. Okay, this is one. And you might have to highlight another thing, and that is the interest, the international interests about the uh, the web free, um, embracing, welcoming policy of Hong Kong, which we uh, we meaning the leaders of Hong governments announced in FinTech Week in Q4 2022. So the entire year of 2023, where we have we have seen a lot of I would say validation trips by people in this field. Again, digital assets, blockchain, crypto, and so on, flying in from all over the world. They can be from the Singapore, the Dubai, even the US, some European firms, even Latin America. So all these folks have been like flying to Hong Kong at different times to really try to talk to all the key stakeholders from the regulators, policymakers, private sector leaders, you know, the investors, VCs, and so on, to try to validate what are the opportunities are uh, in Hong Kong for that. And uh, again, so we have seen so much interest. So by now, we have seen uh, quite a lot of, um, not only the funds, I'm talking about the web free crypto funds, now uh, expanding the presence in Hong Kong or set up new presence in Hong Kong. And because of the, the capital, there are also projects you know, being landed in Hong Kong in different segments. And then uh, there are people uh, exp uh, uh, applying for the uh, VASP license, there are folks uh, eyeing on the upcoming stable cons uh, license uh, that uh, the HMA, the Hong Kong Merger Authority, uh, is looking at uh, launching hopefully sometime this year. So there's just a lot of activities going on within a short period of time in just one year. So again, I can go on and on. So maybe I'll just pause for a moment to see if uh, perhaps Oreo, whether or not there's a certain uh, area that your audience would be most interested, and I'm happy to elaborate. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, I think you touched on many very interesting uh, points um, when it comes to, to what you said now about Web3 or before when you talked about green finance as well, because I know that Hong Kong is becoming a green finance and green fintech hub. Uh, but if I need to highlight one idea, maybe it would be this idea that you said about this intersection between traditional finance and uh, DeFi, decentralized finance or, or newer technologies, right? Because this is here, for example, I've uh, been teaching as well in a program about blockchain and, and financial services and we are all experiencing the rise as well of uh, or the the idea of uh, generative ai becoming much more mainstream and i think it's very interesting uh, what you've been talking about because of course i mean defi companies are defi companies traditional banks are traditional banks but uh, i think this last year we saw and we will be seeing uh, uh, this coming year for sure this kind of um, idea of uh, both areas intertwining much more. Huh? I mean, we've seen like lots of projects by major banks um, tapping into, into DeFi, into using blockchain, into AI. So I think it's very interesting, this trend that you, that you um, highlighted uh, right now. And it's interesting to see that this is of course happening in, in Hong Kong uh, as well. <clears throat> yes, um, so for, perhaps I can touch on a few things you just mentioned. Uh, first of all, Hong Kong is not just about blockchain. It's just one example I just gave. Mm -hmm. And just now, since you talk about uh, AI, perhaps I can comment uh, a little bit on this. Now, so there's a, also a lot of things happening in this, in this area from, so for example, there's this one uh, major insurer uh, in Hong Kong. I mean, it's a multinational uh, global leader. I won't, name, I won't name name, but then they've been experimenting uh, the usage of AI in, uh, throughout the different aspects of the businesses. And then some, sometimes people say, well, maybe this is a fad that people just uh, said that they, they do it for the PR purpose or just to you know, satisfy the wishes of the big, big bosses. But actually, from what I understand, just from talking in more depth uh, with this uh, uh, leader uh, of this major insurer, actually they have done over 100 
of uh, AI projects of different use cases in last year yeah. alone. Mm. Over 100. <laughs> it's, it's, it's amazing, right? They've been yes, yes, yes. doing all sorts of experimentation. Now, so, and people may ask, well, what would that be, right? So let me just give you one example. Now, so naturally, as uh, we recognize in many parts of the world, um, yes, we are going through this whole digitization of insurance, but still, oftentimes the, the old saying is, insurance is always sold, not bought. So that's why you still need the agents to sell insurance and to service the clients. Now, and naturally, now that the whole world has been looking at a lot of, I would say, um, compliance uh, requirements to make sure that the products are not be sold and the different uh, regulatory requirements that the insurers, the banks have been complied. So you can imagine as an agent, it's a daunting task, right? So not only would the agents have to remember the product features of various insurance slash investment products, but at the same time, they also have to remember if I have to do claims for my clients, what kind of process I have to go through. And not only that, they have to remember all these compliance guidelines and whatnot. You can just imagine, right? It's a daunting task to have to sort of uh, cover such a broad base. So interestingly, this insurance leader told me in, in his firm, they have tally where they have over 10,000 documents. 10,000 documents, okay? That the agents have to somehow uh, know where to access to do their job on an ongoing basis. Who can possibly remember where to find those 10,000 documents? Too much. So this is where this is where the AI comes in, okay? Now, so as a result, uh, so again, there are all these practical usage of AI, Georgian AI, that uh, a lot of times, um, I think we kind of take things for granted, but now that you are illustrated that way, most people can relate it right away, okay? So this is exactly where uh, we are now seeing quite a lot of uh, experimentation and innovation of uh, Gen AI or AI in general uh, across Hong Kong in the financial sector. So this is one. Now, and secondly, when people say, oh, you know, a lot, a lot of the innovation happened in uh, just in the US, so what have Asia been doing, right? The whole Asian market been doing. Now, and interestingly, I think for, for, for your audience who may not be familiar with this name, there's this uh, gentleman, his name is Dr. Li Kai-Fu. Mm. So uh, he used to be uh, you know, the senior leader of Google in China. I believe he was the president. And pr prior to that, I think he was with Microsoft and so on. So but after he left Google, he actually set up his own investment firm. And the one thing that has really captured the international media attention uh, is his new venture called zero one dot AI. Mm -hmm. No, zero one dot AI. Okay. Now, and why why would the international media just going like wow? This like wow wow impacts, and that's because this company zero zero uh, one dot AI, they have achieved unicorn status in just eight months since inception. Eight months. Yeah, it's remarkable. And, and it's, it's incredible. This yes, is based in Hong Kong, by the way. And the reason why they are able to achieve such an amazing traction is because, again, uh, when, I, when I got a chance to talk to uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Lee, he uh, shared me that across different metrics, there are certain metrics that the LLM, the large language model built by the CO1.ai, actually outperform OpenAI. Now, of course, I haven't got a chance to really talk to the, the tech uh, community, to do the validation on the data and all that. But now, but that, that, that's amazing. That's an amazing accomplishment, if, if, if that's true, right? In terms of all these, you know, technical benchmarking. Eight months, now they're unicorn. So, so this is something that is uh, also very exciting. Uh, developments uh, in Hong Kong, where we are also trying to uh, share this great news uh, to the broader business community. No, I think uh, it's all uh, very interesting. and. Innovation-wise, um, I mean, I agree with you. I think uh, Asia is very advanced. Uh, I recently myself published uh, a couple of weeks ago an article in the South China Morning Post about uh, China's AI industry, in which basically, I mean, based on, on data and, and facts, I mentioned that uh, China would become an AI 
world leader by 2030 because if you look at the amount not only of like of the whole industry how much movie how much money it moves but also uh, when you look at the amount of um uh, language learning programs um, created in China, if you look at what Chinese companies are doing, if you look, for example, at how much data there is available for these companies because of how many people in China own a cell phone, when you look at all that, you realize that there's a huge potential in there. And uh, related to Hong Kong, then, I think that the ecosystem in Hong Kong is, is thriving in general, not, not just when it comes to AI, but in general to, to startups. I was reading yesterday, I think it was, that... Um, and Cyberport had its, I think it was ninth unicorn. Uh, this press release uh, talked about hash key group, but I mean, it's not just about this group. It's idea in general that uh, not just Cyberport, no, Hong Kong in general is launching new startups, new unicorns. This example that you mentioned now. So I think everything is going in the right uh, path. And, and related to that, I wanted to ask you um, about your outlooks for this coming year, for 2024, or even in the future, right? When it comes not just to fintech, but in general to, to the financial services industry in Hong Kong, to the startup community, whatever you want to share about uh, how you think the future will look like for Hong Kong this year or the coming years? Sure. <laughs> well, uh, first of all, we have uh, seen enormous momentum uh, across you know, the referee, the fintech, you know, all these like new emerging areas. We have seen uh, quite a lot of uh, strong momentum uh, last year. And obviously this year we're going to do double down to just accelerate. Now, I think more substantively, we also see another interesting trend. And that is a lot of uh, mainland Chinese firms uh, in different sectors from new energy, new material, advanced manufacturing. Actually, some of these firms have done so well uh, within China that they felt, well, instead of just like fighting with each other domestically in China, maybe undercutting each other on price, which nobody wants. They thought, well, this is a big world out there. We should go out and look at the world and see where are the other markets where they can uh, contribute well, with their capabilities and all that. Now, so naturally, uh, this is almost like a, I guess I, I, I would say that this is almost like a, um, a common uh, movements in which many of the, I mean, as the saying goes, you know, the, the great minds think alike. You know, many business leaders are doing the same thing. So, so now we are seeing that uh, the capital uh, in Hong Kong, uh, some of them are with the Hong Kong background, some from international background, some from mainland backgrounds, are now gearing up to provide international capital, okay, to these mainland firms, to number one, set up the international headquarters in Hong Kong. Number two, to help them with the connection and the capital to expand to other parts of the world. It, it, it can be uh, EU, it can be ASEAN, it can be Middle East. So different firms have different interests. Now, so, so then as the capital comes in, we also see some VCs also uh, moving uh, the um, some team to then set up shop in Hong Kong. So they might be, they, they might used to be in say Beijing. So now they're setting up their presence in Hong Kong to facilitate what I just described, to help these like mainland firms to go overseas by providing them the capital and a business connection. Now, so this is actually pretty obvious, this trend. As, as a result in Hong Kong, because we have been uh, serving uh, the both ways, right? Two-way traffic where uh, maybe you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, it was mostly helping international firms to use Hong Kong as a conduit to enter the China market. This is still happening. Now, but then at the same time, we are seeing now an enormous you know, interest for mainland firms to use Hong Kong to go to the rest of the world. So as a result, uh, we are already planning some trips this year to Europe, uh, to Middle East, and also Asia, so that we are able to help uh, essentially leverage on the connections that we already have to help these firms to find the right business partners. Because I think for, for those people who have been following what's happening like yourself in Hong Kong, you would notice that last year, 2023, the Hong Kong government leaders, you know, from our chief executive to our financial secretary, to a lot of the ministers, they've been traveling around the world. And in many ways, they've been working tirelessly to lay the foundation. And by signing MOUs with countries like Saudi Arabia, 
you know, the, the UAE, you know, different ASEAN countries. So, so our big bosses have already done and then laid out, lay down the groundwork. So now this year is for us to really take it one step further to go into action. And the, on the almost like a firm specific area, are we able to connect the dots of the firms to help these firms to define business in, this, uh, in, in these markets? So this is another major initiative uh, for us. <clears throat> so I, I can go on and on. So maybe I'll just pause for a minute to see uh, if there's any area you'd like me to elaborate. Well, I mean, I think what you mentioned now is very interesting when it comes to, to Hong Kong's role, because I also mentioned in some of my articles that to me, uh, Hong Kong is no longer, has no longer been these last few years about being just the gateway to China, as we used to think about Hong Kong traditionally. Hong Kong is much more than that. And as you said before, it's not just the gateway to China, but it, it's much more than that, no, in many ways. And related to this, to some extent, I wanted to ask you, like, how do you think Hong Kong uh, benefits from being part of the Greater Bay Area, the GBA, or as well, how do you think the GBA benefits from Hong Kong being part of it? How do you think, or what in synergies do you see between Hong Kong and the rest of the GBA business-wise? Well, <laughs> at the end of the day, uh, when we think about uh, the key elements uh, to, to, to essentially create an international financial center. Of course, it, it, doesn't hap, uh, it, it doesn't happen overnight. It takes like decades uh, to, to build up infrastructure. And by that, is, it is the capital markets, the asset managers, the wealth managers, the lawyers, you know, the, the accountants. So actually all these folks are contributing in creating that ecosystem so that you have all the uh, capabilities to serve the client's needs when it comes to accessing to finance and things like that. Now, so the role for Hong Kong is actually uh, very unique. Now, so for, first of all, uh, Hong Kong has, uh, based on BCG report, uh, Hong Kong is now the second largest uh, cross-border wealth management center in the world, just behind Switzerland. And based on that same BCG report, uh, BCG basically forecasted Hong Kong to uh, surpass Switzerland by the year like 2025. Now, so now the question is why? Now, because uh, actually in another study, we also have seen um, in a study by another consulting firm, we also have seen um, that uh, I guess uh, really you know uh, decent percentage uh, of the, um, the mainland firms they are also trying to use Hong Kong as a base to tap into like international capital. Uh, to also help the firms, as I just mentioned, to go overseas. So this is very clear. Now, so as a result, you can you can you can you can visualize there's just a lot of capital coming through. Now, but then yes, it's not just capital. There are also the nuts and bolts, uh, such as okay, if you want to set up a tax efficient entity, right, to facilitate this kind of like asset management. Well, in Hong Kong, there there are different the vehicles like the LBF limited uh, partnership fund, there's the OFC. So this, these are the super tax efficient vehicle that based on the feedback that we got uh, from a pretty well-known law firm and also a well-known um, uh, big four firm on the tax side, actually the, the, ease, the, the ease and also the cost is just so good, even better than Cayman which is, again, Cayman has been the traditional go-to go -to, uh, market to set up a, an entity to, to do asset management, for example. But now because of low cost, you know, the, the speed of setting this up and also the test concession, <laughs> actually, based on the numbers we have seen, we have seen almost like a hockey stick growth uh, on the setup of these entities, the LPFs and so on. And it's just accelerating. Now, on top of that, <laughs> the Hong Kong government uh, has uh, it has also announced a new what we call the CIES, and it is essentially like a investment uh, uh, migration scheme for folks to uh, invest in Hong Kong to establish, uh, let's say, like a residency, for example. Mm -hmm. Now, so actually, uh, this has already attracted so much attention, and and that scheme is not even launched yet. So hopefully, they'll be launched sometime this year. 
Now, so why would that be relevant? Because when we have this kind of investment uh, scheme, we should the threshold based on the public information shared by the, now it's, it's not responsible uh, and handled by my team, it's handled by another team at Invest Hong Kong. So essentially, uh, there's a certain threshold. So let's just, let's just say 30 million US is a threshold for like a family office or like a high net worth uh, individual that would like to, for example, um, you know, uh, establish a, a presence in Hong Kong via the scheme. So actually the 30 million US, they have to invest into something. Uh, but, there can, but there can be, uh, let's say a fund in Hong Kong that can, act, that can access to an index fund of Europe, tracking the European market as a whole. This is okay too. So this is a very flexible scheme based on what has been uh, shared with the uh, media so far. And then the, the also a certain percentage of that scheme also the ask the, um, the that asset owner to invest into the innovation technology sector. Now, again, I don't want to go into a lot of details because uh, I think the details have not been announced yet. But the point I'm trying to get to, because of that kind of policy, we, we envision that there will be more capital from different parts of the world coming to Hong Kong. And then they need a vehicle. And then we have the LBF, which is very easy to set up. And once you set it up, then they have to put the money to work. And this is where I think the asset managers uh, can come into play. And uh, for some of the uh, high net worth, maybe they need help, the support for the wealth managers. So this is where the, you know, the private banks and wealth managers can come in to offer their professional uh, service to uh, provide them the guidance on portfolio uh, allocation and things like that. And then you may want to set up a trust. And this is where I think some of the other professionals come in. So essentially, when you look at the size of the Hong Kong financial services and also the um, professional services market, we're talking about something like 200,000 people in Hong Kong doing all these activities. So that depth of professionals that are accustomed to and very savvy with the international standard is something that's so unique uh, in, in the GBA. So therefore, for the mainland uh, GBA firms or individuals, high net worth firm offices, they would like to do what I just described. Hong Kong is a great place to offer all the different services to them in a super efficient way. Mm -hmm. Um, well, actually, I wanted to ask you now, but I think it's quite related to what you said now. I wanted to ask you, why should an investor or any company willing to, to do business choose Hong Kong over other jurisdictions? I mean, leaving aside the fact that Hong Kong is the gateway to China, no, but leaving aside mainland China um, being there, right? I mean, in general, why would you say that uh, Hong Kong should be um, chosen as a destination for an investor, I know you already told me part of that now, but if, I, if you have any further ideas about that. Sure, well, I, well, th 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 there are so many reasons, but let me just, in the interest of time, let me just highlight three. Now, first of all, when an investor go to a, a, a place uh, to invest, uh, what do they care the most? Well, they care a lot about the breadth and depth of investment opportunities. Right? If you go to, uh, I'm just saying, let's say you go to North Pole, right? even if there's like 0% tax, you won't go there, right? No. There's nothing to invest. Nothing. So number one, you have to have the breadth and depth of investment products, which Hong Kong has a lot to offer. So that's one. Now, and secondly, you want to go to a place in which the tax is efficient, right? So just now I mentioned the LPF and all this structure, essentially uh, with some, tax planning too, is super low tax, if at all. There's certain tax concession. So it's a super tax efficient uh, um, area where for the asset managers invest and so on, particularly, I think if the investment return is not that great in a down market, so every bit of cost you can save is actually very meaningful to your bottom line. So, so this is not something we can take for granted easily. Second. Tax, tax, if, tax and cost efficiency. And three, uh, we're talking about simply just how quickly things get done. Okay, mm -hmm. so if you go to come to Hong Kong, because again, this is something that uh, sometimes people laugh at, in which uh, the Hong Kong the professionals, 
work around the clock. So sometimes they may not, uh, they may not have a very good work-life balance during the week. So that's why sometimes they have to, you know, take a vacation to melt dives and so on. Now, so uh, uh, during during long vacation. So the reason why I mentioned this is because we've talked to so many uh, investors around the world, and you go to look at Hong Kong efficiency. This is like world class. You you, you have a certain request, and you can get it done in the days, maybe like weeks versus like you know months in some other jurisdictions. And this is something that is, is hard for me to, 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 to talk too much. But then if you do ask around, people that have been doing businesses in finance and so on, in Hong Kong and other jurisdictions, they will tell you exactly the same thing, that it's super efficient to get things done in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. No, no, I, I can vouch for that myself as, as someone who used to, to live and work in Hong Kong. I mean, I wasn't, like properly investing there, but still you can feel that the whole business environment is very flexible and, and much faster and more efficient <clears> than in many other uh, places for sure. And yeah. just oh, before- Can I just add one more thing? Sure, sure. Sorry, please. Sorry for you to, to no, 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 please go ahead. Yeah, yeah well, um, not just now I talk about the business aspect, mm -hmm. but then at the same time, I have to also recognize that we are all humans. We can't just talk about businesses without considering the, the social, the okay. personal aspects. Now, so for example, I'd like to, to quote this uh, Swiss uh, CEO of a fintech firm. So he's been in Hong Kong for something like more than 10 years. He loves Hong Kong. And in fact, he said, well, uh, it's okay. There's something you have to understand. But first of, first of all, he's super fit. So he runs a marathon and you know mm -hmm. hiking all the time. In fact, he uh, was the person who introduced me to this video. It's called Four Trails. Trails as in, in the hiking trails. Yeah, yeah. So for, for your audience, you can just Google it. Now, so essentially, when you look at that Four Trails uh, video, you will see the beautiful landscape of all the, the mountains and whatnot in Hong Kong, in which actually the expatriate community, they love it. They just love the nature, the hike, you can go to the beaches, all within say 30 minutes from a CBD. So if you just happen to want to, after like a long day at work, you, you want, you know what? I want to go for a hike, like 4 p.m. You get off work from the CBD and the IFC, and then you, you take a taxi or something to go to a hike in 30 minutes, you are in the mountains. So this kind of convenience and the sort of diversity of the nature is something that's so actually captive captivating to the expatriate uh, finance community. Mm -hmm. And then of course, I think we have so many Michelin star restaurants. I mean, people are very, are very nice. It's like it's super safe you know, to walk around in Hong Kong. You can just walk around Hong Kong at night, 1 a.m., no problem, yeah. right? Yeah. So all these things are things that sometimes people take for granted or they underestimate the importance of all these factors to make so sort of living and working in Hong Kong an enjoyable experience. No, I mean, I can tell based on my experience that this this is all very important. I actually know that uh, many people start like uh, liking or getting in love with Hong Kong um, after business, right? I mean, they start doing business with Hong Kong and then they get to know Hong Kong. In my case, it was the opposite. No, I, I came to Hong Kong as a tourist like back in 2008 when I was starting uh, to study in university. And, and then it was when I decided that I wanted to do more in Hong Kong. Now then that's why I did internships in Hong Kong. I did my PhD. I, I worked there after that because I initially liked Hong Kong. Everything you said now, no, it's convenience, uh, no, everything. I mean, you can be working in CBD, like, and then uh, walk or take a taxi and then 20 minutes uh, after that, like be, you no, know, in the, the countryside, in the mountains. I mean, there's so much to do, so much to see. So I think, I mean, I fully agree with you. No, I think it wouldn't be fair just to highlight Hong Kong's uh, prowess when it comes to finance or its banking system, uh, whilst neglecting you know, all this environment uh, or this perfect environment for precisely these industries to thrive. You know, because I think there's a lot to, to do and to see. And that, of course, helps uh, Hong Kong's, uh, not just fintech, but the whole industry to, to be, I think, uh, much better or at least to attract much more talent. Mm -hmm. Yep. And well, um, just before wrapping this up, we're running out of time, but if you could, like, uh, in, in like uh, in one minute or so, let me know, please, 
uh, some examples of international cooperation with Hong Kong in the fintech or in general financial industry, because we saw this last year, many MOUs being signed by, as you said, you know, the chief executive or, or the finance uh, chief um, in, in Saudi Arabia, Middle East, in many places. So what are, according to you, the main um, cooper international cooperation projects in either fintech or finance in general that Hong Kong has been engaged with? Well, um, there are just uh, so many that uh, sometimes I, I lose track and I don't want to just um, offend anyone if I just single out one. Mm -hmm. I guess maybe I can ask you a question in a different way. Uh, so why would these uh, firms, where that, where, where that they, they were from, uh, the US or, you know, maybe Europe, you know, Singapore and so on, there's, there's a few things in common about uh, why they came to Hong Kong and, uh, and the businesses they've been uh, doing uh, successfully. Now, first of all, uh, when they came to Hong Kong, the one thing in common is that, uh, particularly if they're doing B2B, B2B the FinTech, so naturally you want to sell to the major financial institutions, mm -hmm. right? Be it the banks, the insurers, asset managers, and so on. Um, if we were to talk about the um, international firms set up in Hong Kong and how uh, have they done so far? Mm -hmm. So let me use uh, uh, perhaps one, one company, I, I won't name name, uh, but then uh, this is a, a good example to illustrate uh, why the you know, companies like FinTech and so on would choose Hong Kong. Now, first of all, the, this company that I'm about to describe uh, is from the US originally. Mm -hmm. So what they do is a platform that offer uh, different alternative asset funds. And in fact, they have aggregated uh, the, the alternative asset funds from all the major asset managers, all the big names you can think of. Now, and uh, naturally, uh, if you have platform like this, this is a great way for this sort of you know, capability to be offered to the wealth managers, to the banks, to even the family offices. And the reason being, when you look at the uh, international trends, uh, more and more um, investors from, you know, again, high net worth, family offices, institutional, even pension funds are now allocating a bigger percentage of their total worth into alternative assets. But then but since there's so many out there, you have to find them one by one, full talking different companies, the efficiency is very low. Now, but this US company, they thought, well, because of Hong Kong being IFC, it's going to be much easier and, and efficient for them to access many potential clients. So then they decided to sell the shop in Hong Kong. And since then, they've been reaching out to, you know, again, the, the Chinese, you know, FIs and, and different potential clients. And so they're now expanding their footprints, mainly because there's just a lot of capital in Hong Kong waiting to be deployed to the high quality uh, products. And having a platform like this would allow them to connect the high quality products with the capital. So this is why people come to Hong Kong. And this is a very good example. Now, and then the, if I were to go uh, further, so let's just say that uh, in, in China. Now, so in China, they also have uh, just a lot of innovation in AI, for example. Mm -hmm. Now, because um, in Hong Kong, the languages uh, spoken and handled in the business context uh, are both English and Chinese. And a lot of times we look at the client base, they're also a lot mix of English speaking and also the Chinese speaking clients are predominantly. So therefore you need, let's say NLP, like a chatbot type of capability. You can't just do it in English. You have to do it multilingual. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have seen some uh, pretty capable, uh, is sometimes these are listed companies specializing in AI. So this, this one firm from Beijing and they have served the hundreds of thousands of FIs and now they are, they are expanding their presence in Hong Kong because they see that a lot of these uh, FIs in Hong Kong, they need the multilingual help that also need to have the domain expertise in that engine, the large language model in different financial segments, wealth management, insurance, right, uh, personal finance, and so on. So that's why the main firm are also 
uh, this minimum firm I, I, I'm just describing is also expanding present in Hong Kong. So, you, so in conclusion, you can see that because the way that the unique position of Hong Kong, we are actually attracting and have the market for some of the capable uh, firms from both the international markets as well as from the, the mainland China market. Mm -hmm. I see. No, I mean, thank you very much for for sharing this, King. And well, I mean, unfortunately, we'll need to wrap up our episode. Um, it's, unless you want to make some some more remarks, of course, uh, about uh, any of the topics we discussed. Um, but I mean, if not, I think it. I mean, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you, and it's been great to to get to see um, what Hong Kong has been doing this last year and the future outlooks for Hong Kong, its potential as well. Now, and everything you talked about, uh, fintech, uh, traditional finance, traditional finance, and fintech, uh, converging all these ideas why Hong Kong, um, what Hong Kong has good aside no, from the business uh, environment, everything you, you told has been very important, I think. And I'm sure that uh, my listeners will appreciate that very much, especially, I guess, those listeners who may not be uh, so aware uh, of Hong Kong, uh, because um, I think that uh, you need to have been in Hong Kong to fully grasp uh, what you're talking about, right? Uh, so I think uh, it's going to be very helpful for for everyone to listen to this episode. And well, congratulations on all the work you do at Invest Hong Kong um, to to promote Hong Kong and its uh, and its potential. Now, because I think uh, there's there's a lot to do there. Yeah. Well, I guess as a sort of <laughs> final thought uh, for your audience, sure. uh, there's just a lot of things happening, and to keep track, I suggest the audience to number one, uh, go to the LinkedIn. LinkedIn page of ours is uh, you, you can just easily search us uh, under the keyword fintech hk one word fintech hk and then you'll find our LinkedIn page where we post uh, all the events and major uh, happenings uh, in Hong Kong and secondly there are different uh, events throughout the year but particularly in March April as well as uh, October and November these two cluster we have a lot of the mega impact events in March, April, and also October, November. So including the FinTech week you know, on the 28th and 29th of October. So uh, so again, you can uh, find information about these events from the FinTech HK LinkedIn page. So uh, we encourage you to join us either online or physically uh, come and join us in Hong Kong as well. And we'll be, we'll be more than happy to, uh, to serve you and also connect you with some of the local stakeholders uh, when your audience come to Hong Kong to visit us. Well, actually, we didn't have time to discuss the Hong Kong uh, FinTech Week, so we can do this in another occasion, but it's a very important event uh, to which I encourage all uh, my listeners to, to participate either physically or virtually, because I'm sure they will learn a lot, not just about FinTech in Hong Kong and, or China, but about FinTech trends in general. And I'm going to be adding all those links uh, here below on the screen uh, so they can um, check all these uh, websites and, and LinkedIn pages that you just uh, mentioned because I'm sure that out there there are like many interested people uh, both in Europe, uh, uh, US, other parts of Asia interested in, in Hong Kong who, who might be of course potentially uh, well interested in, in learning more about how to invest there or starting business there so I think uh, this episode and these links will be very helpful to them. Great. So um, All right. thank you very much, King, for, for your time. I know you're very busy, so I appreciate uh, you taking the time to come here uh, very much. It's an absolute pleasure to talk to you and well, to all my listeners. Thank you very much for listening to this episode. And you know, if you have any further questions, feel free to further uh, reach out either to me or to King. Great. So th thanks for having, having me. And uh, it's a great pleasure to always uh, talk and uh, share more information with your audience. The pressure is mine and well, thank you very much, all of you. See you in the next episode. Okay. Okay. Thank you.